So I spotted this thing on eBay uh, earlier this year and what a piece of junk. Uh, spent 99 cents on it, uh, overpaid by about 99 cents because this thing is just an expensive piece of firewood. Um, but I thought, whoa, what a challenge. Uh, see if I can make this thing into something better. And you want a sneak peek? Uh, sh this is what I got it looking like, and even uh, it's even pretty functional too. So hang out for the next uh, 30 minutes or so, and I'll show you how I did it. This is Working Wooden Planes. I'm Abraham. I take antique planes and get them back into working condition. So yeah, like I said, um, eBay purchase. I like to spend some time on eBay now and again, looking at, uh, looking for possible deals, looking for possible projects. Um, saw this thing, and uh, not surprisingly, I was the only bidder for it. Uh, got it in the mail, and man, if it's even possible, it was worse condition than I thought it was in. Um, super dried out, uh, just completely desiccated. Yeah, a real, a real piece of junk. Um, so let's. Let's take it apart and, um, and, and get a good idea of, of what exactly is wrong with it. Um, first off, the wood is just completely dried out um, and it's split in multiple places, got huge cracks through it. The biggest one obviously is in the toe. Um, you can't totally tell, but that crack actually goes all the way down to the base of the throat. This toe is almost completely split in half. Um, it's just the only place that it's holding together is right down there uh, towards the bottom tip. Um, and yeah, major, major problem. That's the first thing that we're gonna have to address with this. Um, next bit is that the cheek at the top has split out um, and will need to be repaired. The cheek itself is, is popped out, both uh, at the back of it and the front of it on the right side. Um, left side looks a little bit better. Um, but this wood, I mean, you can just take your fingernail and just scrape it off. It's so dried out. Um, so when I sand this thing down, you know, my, one of my main concerns was that if I just start sanding, I'm just going to keep sanding until there's nothing left. Um, surprisingly, the uh, sole is totally flat somehow. I don't know how that's even possible, but yeah. Completely flat, we won't need to do much to lap the sole. Um, so that's one, one less thing that needs to be done with it. So I'm gonna use epoxy resin to try and stabilize the cracks in the toe. Um, one of the things I wanna avoid hopefully having to do is to put a, some kind of reinforcement through the toe itself side to side to stabilize it. Um, and there's a, there's a precedent for that. You can find plenty of old smoothing planes like this that have um, something stuck through the, through the toe to prevent splitting, because um, it's a pretty common uh, problem. So this is like a DIY where somebody used it, somebody did something um, to keep the toe from, from the crack in that from spreading. You can, even, you can even buy them new with the reinforcements um, in it. This is a plane from a earlier restoration video and it came from the, from the manufacturer that way. It came from the, from the factory that way. Um, so I really don't want to have to do that. Um, I'm hoping that the, the resin will, 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 will make it strong enough where we don't have to. But, the proof is going to be the minute I, I smack it with a mallet when I am resetting the iron, and um, the whole thing, if it's you know, it's going to split apart. So let's look at the wedge real quick. Wedge happens to be in fairly decent condition. It's got some cracks in it, um, but surprisingly, uh, much better condition than the plane itself. Um, the iron is. Gonna have to try and pop that, pop that open. Um, luckily, it wasn't completely frozen. Uh, as you can see, serious, serious rust all over the iron. So yeah, deep, deep, heavy, heavy rust. Expect some real serious pitting in there. 
Um, I ended up leaving this in uh, vapor rust for five, five full days to get all the rust off. I take it out once a day and scrub it and then throw it back in the vapor rust. Surprisingly, the, the, the edge of the iron is in pretty, pretty decent shape. No, no huge chunks out of it, nothing major missing. Um, so ended up being fairly easy to put a new, a new bevel on that. I clean up the bevel and put a new bevel on it. Um, so normally I would never sand uh, a, a plane I was restoring. Um, you never want to take off the original finish or the finish that's built up over time, patina if you want to call it that. Um, but this, you know, th this is just dead rotten wood on the outside and I don't know if it's rotten, but it's completely dried out. So I thought to get it back into at least a, a better looking shape, um, I would sand it and just sand the surface roughness off um, because this thing was so dried out that, like I said, you could just start sanding and keep sanding and keep sanding and end up with nothing but a pile of dust. Um, so first one side. And as you can see, I'm using 100 um, grit on this. After I was done with 100 grit, I used I believe it was 220 um, as a final sanding, um, but the bulk of the work was done with this 100 grit. And really, this was the, the the bulk of the work that was you know done on the body. Aside from eventually, we're going to use um, some epoxy resin and, and fill in some of those cracks, um, but it was just sanding it, sanding it down that took um, probably a good 30 minutes or so um, trying to get it off, trying to get it to, to something that looked a little bit better. The uh, didn't, I'm not sanding the sole um, right now because I'll lap that later on. Um, so right now I'm just focusing on the top and the sides and then uh, inside the throat as well. So once I was finished, um, you know, this is kind of what I expected it to look like. Um, kind of a big, you know, we're gonna have to wait and see what it looks like once we put some some um, some wax on it and and hopefully make it look a little a little more finished. Um, but yeah, a lot of that you could still you could still just take your thumbnail and and grind out more wood. So the first thing I want to do here is we're going to try and fix the cheek um, and fix um, right behind the eye. So just take some a little bit of epoxy and a syringe, mix it on up. And then we're just going to try and inject that down kind of as deep as we can into the throat or into the cheek. Clamp that, try not to squeeze too much of the epoxy out. And then I'm going to try and do the same thing with the cheeks themselves where they've split out. Um, the there's a lot of outward force um, that occurs when the iron is in place and is, has been wedged in place uh, with the wedge and um, a lot of forward force that occurs as well um, as the wedge is is jammed into place too so these two the places that have cracked um, the likelihood of this splitting open again is pretty high um, the other thing that's that's going on here too is that the wood is so dry that the epoxy ends up just soaking into the wood. It doesn't actually sit in between the in the open space between where the cracks are. Um, so after I had epoxied this, I went back again uh, on the cheek and added a little bit more because um, this first time around it just it, like I said it just soaked in. Um, 
there wasn't any excess to, to uh, that it was even getting squeezed out when I put the um, when I put the clamps on. Um, so doesn't really bode well for how strong this um, this is going to be later on. On to the resin. Um, so taping this thing up um, pretty good. I really wanted to tape up the base because I just didn't know if all these cracks just went straight through to the bottom. Um, I was going to end up dumping resin all out through the when I tried to pour it in. Um, I wasn't really sure how deep I was going to get the resin to go in those cracks as well. Uh, ended up being pretty successful, but I knew that the issue, like with the um, when I was epoxying the sides of the of the cheek, um, is that this resin was just going to start soaking in and soaking in, um, and uh, I would never get the it to pool completely flat on the top of the toe. Um, because as it slowly cured, it would continue to soak in and I'd never be able to add enough um, to the top to get it to, to sit completely flat, if that makes any sense, um, which ended up being uh, a problem. But um, for the first pour, um, it was, it worked out, it worked out pretty well. It got really deep inside those cracks. Um, so once I had it taped up, uh, I was pretty happy with with the with how it looked, um, and gonna skip forward through this pretty quick. It's very self-explanatory if you've ever used it before. Equal parts hardener, equal parts um, resin. Uh, you mix it really, really well. Um, I didn't have a decent container, so I ended up using a, a Tupperware. Um, I also mixed it to go off pretty slow. Um, didn't want it to, to go off super hot and and not have enough time for this to, to just mess around with it. Um, so I really debated over whether or not I wanted to um, just leave it clear. Um, and I thought that you'd just be able to see too many bubbles and it might look kind of funky. So I decided to use uh, a dark gray. Um, I didn't have any brown. Uh, I couldn't find any brown um, coloring. So I went with gray and um, yeah, it is what it is. Um, what happened though is that I ended up, like I said, I was worried about it, it curing completely flat and it didn't, it cured with a little dip in the toe, which you'll see here in a minute. Um, so I mixed up a second batch and I um, mixed it up a lot hotter and poured it. And because of the difference in the, the curing temperature, um, the second um, batch looked a little bit different than the first batch. And so there's this like kind of, it's not a discoloring, it's just a sort of, um, the epoxy ended up not looking quite as smooth or the, the resin ended up not having a really consistent color um, which is an aesthetic issue it's not the end of the world um, but I wish it could have looked a little bit better uh, the final product um, this is what it looked like the first batch um, taking the tape off from it you can see that dip in there where as it cured, it continued to soak into the wood. Um, I was pretty surprised though that I was able to get such deep penetration into the into the cracks of the wood. Um, that that major crack ended up filling all the way down to the. Uh, to the soul. I was really, uh, I was very pleasantly surprised. So this is still uh, the first batch, sanded it down. And I didn't film uh, any of the second batch. I mean, it's redundant, we already saw the first one. Um, 
this is what the final one looked like. This is the final, um, this is up to the second um, resin pour. Um, uh, I wasn't 100% sure what to do with the, to, to finish the wood. Um, I ended up deciding to use oil soap on it. I thought that the oils would do, would be helpful to the damaged wood. Um, this is what I would do with a normal um, plane to, cl to clean it up. Um, this one, obviously, all the dirt had already been rubbed off, um, or excuse me, sanded off. Um, but I thought that uh, the oil from the oil soap, the Murphy's oil soap, would, would help the wood. And I think I was right. I think that was the right call to make. So once I had done all the sides, um, I put two coats of paste wax on it um, to finish it off. Um, and uh, I think I ended up with it looking okay. Um, for how it started, uh, this is definitely a massive improvement. Um, you know, that, that, that resin, you know, I mean, there's no way around it. It looks kind of funky. Um, it looks kind of weird, um, but I don't really think there was a, a choice. You, we had to stabilize that, um, those cracks somehow. Um, and I think this was the only, really the only option, um, that was really available. Uh, I can't, I couldn't think of a, of a better way to do it. If you, if you can think of a better way to do this, let me know in the comments. Um, it's not, uh. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally open to, to suggestions for something like this if I ever decide to do it again in the future. So the irons sat in a vapor rust for five full days. Uh, this is the final, the final day. Um, I'm still, still getting rust off of them. Um, serious deep pitting. Um, not to be surprised considering the condition it was in. Um, but they cleaned up okay. I mean, they cleaned up as good as you can expect. Um, chip breaker looked okay. Iron had a lot more, a lot more rust still on it that needed to come off. Once I finished um, scrubbing those down, it was time to flatten the back, making sure to keep that cooled off in a little glass of water. Um, flatten the back um, for two reasons. One of them, you want to make sure that the chip breaker uh, and the iron can um, have very flat contact between the two of them. There's a real solid marriage between the two of them. Um, and the second reason is, is you're gonna put a little back bevel on this and you need it to be flat for that as well. Uh, then after that, so just tried to clean up the existing bevel. Um, and at the same time, start to put a tiny bit of a camber uh, on it as well. So rocking it back and forth. Um, and was able to clean up most of the the pits and the the um, chunky bits that were missing. I um, was able to grind it down far enough. Um, so from there, put it on the 300. Um, again, it's kind of hard to tell because this is sped up, but putting a little bit of a camber on it, rocking it back and forth as I sharpen. Um, and it sharpened up pretty quick. I, I thought I was going to have to do a lot more work on this, but it, it, uh, I was able to put a, a new bevel on it very quickly. Um, took a file and filed off the corners, which you want to do on a smoothing plane so you don't get steps in, the, uh, in your work surface. Uh, you just want to take the sharp edges off. And from there, it went to the 1000 grit, probably spent about five minutes um, on each side of the plate on the 300 and the 1000. Um, like I said, it was pretty it was surprisingly quick. Uh, stropped it and 
obligatory shaving of the hair. Got a nice and sharp. So now it comes to um, bedding, rebedding the the throat, uh, rebedding the iron, and flattening the throat. You want there to be uh, consistent contact between the iron at the top of the throat and at the bottom of the throat, right at the mouth. Um, you don't want any high spots in between. Um, you can make the iron can make contact in between the top of the throat and the mouth, but it has to be consistent all the way across. Um, and old planes like this, it very rarely is. Um, and if you don't get that completely flat, you get chatter. Um, and it really screws up when you're trying to trying to use the the plane. The, you'll get really funky shavings, which you'll which you will see in a minute. Um, once you get that flattened down, and in theory, if the cheeks, the glue on the cheeks holds, the epoxy on the cheeks holds, then all of the components of the plane, the wedge and the iron, and the chip breaker, and the plane itself should hold steady. Um, Put the chip breaker on here, gave it about a 32nd of an inch. Expose that gap between the chip breaker and the iron is the thickness of your shaving. And let's set the iron here. Needs to get set a little deeper. And surprisingly, at least I was surprised, we got it to work. Now what was happening as I was planing, and I didn't <clears throat> watch it happen, but it was occurring, is that the cheek is splitting out again. That the force on the cheek by the, um, just from using it, popped open every place there I tried to glue it. Um, which I'm not really surprised by. Um, that was that was a difficult difficult thing to glue up, and um, not really certain what I could have done more outside of actually just screwing them down, maybe. Um, but while this works really well uh, on the edge of a board, um, that's not how you use a smoothing plane. Um, in fact, if you ever watch restoration videos and the person who's restoring them only planes on the edge of a board, uh, that's cheating. Um, this is not a uh, this is not a joiner. This is not a jack plane. This is made to be used on the face of a board. So let's use it on the face of a board. See how it does. So it's worth noting that the this plane was used. Uh, oh oh, I I lapped the sole and didn't film it. So. The sole has already been um, has already been lapped. It's just noting, worth noting real quick that the mouth here is very wide. Um, the only way to deal with that would be to chop out um, the sole in front of the mouth and put a new insert in there. Um, ideally, you want the iron to be about a sixteenth of an inch uh, away from the front of the mouth, and there's no way that the way that it is now that we would get. Uh, so yeah, there's. You can see where that's all split open again. Anyways, the mouth is so big, we're never gonna get the super fluffy shavings that we would expect to get from a smoothing plane. Um, but I still think that we can, I still think that we can get it to work. Um, yeah, that's, that's all separated. Oh well, I tried. So what you're going to see is that as we use this normally, um, there's going to be some chatter and there's going to be some of those weird, they look like um, ridged uh, potato chips. Um, and that's from the iron bouncing around as, it, as we plane. But the thing that was surprising to me is that we only got a little bit of chatter that I was actually able to use this. Um, really it worked really well it worked surprisingly well that's a, um, a deeper 
uh, those are thicker shavings than I would ideally want with a with a smoothing plane. Um, but we're not getting any steps. Um, I think a lot of the reason it's working well is because the iron is super sharp, um, and it's actually just not the iron is just not moving around as much as I thought that it would. And we're getting it's doing a great job. And um, we're talking you know, icy slick. Um, there's one of those, uh, those ridge shavings from the iron moving around. Um, but it's not happening with every pass, which is what I really thought would be going on. Yeah, this is as smooth as you would ever get it with uh, smoother than you would ever get it with sandpaper. So now, final test. We need to release the iron, so we got to hit it with the mallet. Uh, got to pop that iron loose, and surprisingly. Uh, it stayed it stayed steady it didn't it didn't pop open which is really what i expected it uh to do the minute i the minute i smacked it um i don't know how much more how much more it could take without without busting open but um yeah uh it uh this was uh started off pretty bad and got to um, an okay place, I think. Um, it's not something I'm gonna be using every day, um, but it was a fun project. And uh, tell me what you think. Tell me what you th if you think I should have done anything differently, if the that resin repair was really the, the only way to do this, if there was a, a better option. Um, the, uh, like I said, it was essentially an expensive piece of firewood. Um, and it was fun turning it back into something that was actually usable. Uh, if you like these videos, do the whole comment, subscribe, like thing. Um, it's really fun to, to see that other people have been enjoying these, these videos and watching them and are digging the same kind of stuff. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for watching and goodbye.